Hi everybody, happy Friday. Dr. Bridget Young from babyformulaexpert.com here to talk about another infant feeding topic today. We are getting a little bit juicy because we are gonna be talking about whether or not, this is a big topic, whether or not you should feed your baby another mom's milk or milk sharing in general. So let's get started. My name is Bridget Young. I'm a doctor of perinatal nutrition, a certified lactation counselor, and founder of babyformulaexpert.com. And I get this question, I mean, maybe not as much as some other questions that I usually get questions about infant formula, but milk sharing is actually a very common practice and a very, I don't know, clinically, it's a very big deal. So I'm going to talk about it today. So officially, the official recommendation is, of course, that you breastfeed your, if you are a mother, you breastfeed your baby your own milk. If that is not an option, the next best option is to provide pasteurized donor human milk. Um, this is unrealistic over the long term because we just don't have enough donor milk. And in fact, in lots of places, um, donor milk is unavailable to you unless your baby is premature or has some health conditions. Like we just don't have a lot of um, milk bank milk available, which is why of course we have formula and a lot of women choose to feed their baby another mom's milk that they acquire from the mother themselves. Technically, this is called informal milk sharing. So that's the term you wanna use if you wanna look at some medical literature on the topic, informal milk sharing. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So informal milk sharing is obviously super common, especially between relatives. In some cultures, it's very common. I mean, wet nursing, babies being passed around between moms, aunts, cousins. Um, it's, it's as common as nursing your own baby. Obviously, that's not the case in the U.S., but still, informal milk sharing is very common here, um, although a lot of people don't talk about it very much. They don't talk about it very much because officially from the medical community, um, it's a no-no, meaning the FDA, the Food, Drug and, Food and Drug Administration, HMBANA, which stands for the Human Milk Banking Association of North America, and the European Milk Banking Association officially take the stance that there should be no informal milk sharing, period. And that's the end of the discussion. So I think that's a little unfortunate because it kind of reminds me of homemade formula, the kind of topic, because it makes it a little controversial. And if we refuse to discuss it, then a lot of unsafe practices happen because people don't want to share that they're doing it and we don't have an open discussion about if you're going to do it, how to do it safely. So that's what I want to talk about today. I keep referring to, I got a bunch of notes on the topic. So it's my opinion that it doesn't help any babies to not discuss it. So I had to tell you, you know, the official stance from the Food and Drug Administration is you should not milk share. Um, that being said, I'm going to share a lot of everything else I share now is just my opinion. You guys know I'm not a real doctor. I have a PhD. I'm not an MD, so I can't give any medical advice. But milk sharing happens. It's happening a lot, whether medical practitioners want to uh, um, acknowledge it or not, just like homemade formula is happening a lot. So my goal today is to talk to you about what you need to consider if you're going to participate in human in in informal milk sharing, either as a donor or as a recipient, um, in order to make sure you're doing it in the safest possible way for your baby, which is of course what everybody wants. And my usually I say donors want that too. People have this like dark opinion about oh you're getting milk from another woman. Well, if another woman is donating her breast milk to you, I mean I find that I try to think about the best in people. Those women are obviously mothers as well, and and they want the best for your baby, just like you want the best for any stranger's baby that you see. It's a baby. We all love babies. So that's kind of how I'm trying to approach this. Um, okay, so I'm going to share a lot of information with you. A lot of this comes from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, which recently put out a statement about informal milk sharing. So some of it is from that and, and then the rest is just from my personal opinion and also my experience with this. So before I get started, I will make the official confession here that I have participated in informal milk sharing plenty. <laughs> I have had the greatest honor and privilege of nursing um, a niece and nephew of mine, actually like nursing them at my own breast and also providing pumped milk to both a niece and a nephew. I was very blessed at the beginning of both of my breastfeeding journeys to have a lot of milk at the beginning. So I had more than I could handle and I had little babies I knew who needed it. So I I shipped milk, I nursed the babies, I saved milk for them, and then I was also the recipient. So my sister-in-law gave me milk when 
um, I have two young children that are very close in age. And when my oldest was about eight months old, I was already very pregnant with my second, lost a bunch of my milk supply and could no way keep up with Petey's needs. And so my sister-in-law provided me milk that she had extra. And I will just, I will forever be grateful to her. Helped him get over some diarrhea he was having. I mean, it just, like I said, I will forever be grateful that she shared that precious gift with me. Good little cherry, thinking about it. Ooh, moving on. So I have personal experience with this and I have professional experience with this um, in terms of hearing women's stories. So this is what you want to think about if you are going to participate in informal milk sharing, um, mostly from the perspective of a recipient a recipient. So the first thing that you want to consider is you would like your donor to have been screened in some way. Um, and this could be even a conversation that you have with them. So of course it's going to be best if you personally know your donor because then you can trust that they're giving you honest answers. Your second best is if you are at least not giving them money. Not because I don't think, I mean, paying for milk would be a great thing, but if they're not taking money, then they have no motivation to lie to you. So that's an unfortunate truth. But um, that aside, this is what you wanna ask. You want the mom to have been healthy when she pumped the milk, because you don't want, you know, if she had an infection or anything, you don't want any of that potentially to be in milk, so you want her to be healthy. You wanna know what medications she is taking. Um, including like Advil, Tylenol, et cetera. Anything she may have been taking and you wanna check if those medications are safe for use for it's safe for the baby for breastfeeding. The best place to look is LactMed, which is a, a website. Um, it's a really long name, so just Google LactMed and then you can get there and it will give you, and you can look up any medication, it will tell you about it in the context of breastfeeding. The other place is, um, it's a textbook called Medications and Mother's Milk by Dr. Hale, H-A-L-E. And usually you can Google that and Google the medication you're looking for and you'll be able to find the page in the textbook online that covers that medication. So you wanna check any medications she was taking at the time in either of those places to make sure it's safe for the baby. Next, you wanna be sure the particular um, viruses that we're concerned about passing in milk are HIV, no explanation needed there, and hepatitis B, also no explanation needed. So again, if you know your donor, they probably know. Women are screened for these diseases during pregnancy. So any woman who received prenatal care will ha have known her status during pregnancy. And then it's just how comfortable you are um, assuming that that's also her status postpartum. So if she's like, you know, 12 months along, 12 months afterwards, you know, just be sure she hasn't had any unprotected sex with other partners or had any hepatitis B exposure. Again, these are usually, I feel like, probably rare conditions in the context of women who are donating breast milk. Um, but you need to check. This is your baby's health. So you got to ask. Next, of course, you don't want her to be having used any illicit drugs. Let me clarify here. This includes marijuana. So y'all know I just came from Colorado. So there we have to say, do you use any recreational drugs? No. Do you use marijuana? Oh, well, yes. So you got to sometimes differentiate that you include marijuana, any recreational marijuana use. I probably wouldn't want you to use milk donated anywhere near the time that she used marijuana um, because it does go into the breast milk. No smoking, probably obvious. Also no nicotine. So a lot of moms are able to quit smoking, but they're using gum or patches. If mom is using those, that nicotine does get into the breast milk. And so um, it's probably better safe not to take milk from a mom who has um, nicotine exposure while she's expressing, expressing milk that you're considering using. So that's what you wanna cover with the mom. So that's just a really candid conversation. And remember, a mom who's offering you her breast milk is you know, probably a lovely person, and she's not gonna be embarrassed by having those questions because she has a baby herself. She understands that you need to be cautious. So don't feel embarrassed asking. Next, you wanna inquire a little bit about pumping and storage practices because that's, so there's, you know, we, we want to handle all the potential avenues of infection in the milk. One would be from the mom herself, so you got to ask all these questions. The next is contamination from pumping. So you want to ask maybe what type of pump she's using, make sure she knows how to clean her breast pump parts um, appropriately and often, that she sterilizes them every once in a while. Um, and that she went after she pumps milk it goes into the freezer really quickly that milk's not sitting out for a long time before it gets into the freezer it's really nice if you're going to be working with a donor it's you know like a girlfriend or something if you offer maybe to buy them some sterilization kits or provide them with breast milk bags because i personally know i ran out of sterilization kits many times and it just took me a while to get to the store so it's not like i didn't want to sterilize my 
pump parts. I just, you know, didn't get around to it so often. So if someone had given me the kits, I would have used them. <laughs> so that might be a gentle way you can offer to um, improve the sterilization by providing her with some of the supplies, replacement breast pump parts, you know, things that can help ensure you that the milk is being collected appropriately. And then you want to be sure the milk has been stored in the freezer the whole time. Um, so prod her memory she might have forgotten like have you had any power outages it would be hard for um maybe for her to remember but you don't want the milk to have been stored in a freezer where you know the power went out for 24 hours so that milk probably thawed and then refreezed i'd be a little worried about that refreezed refroze i'd be a little worried about that in terms of being able to guarantee that that's you know a quality milk without any contamination um, and lastly, I'm not going to say a lot about this except that shipping milk is really hard to do well. I disclose that I have personally shipped milk to family members, but um, you know, I work in a biomedical lab and I've been shipping tissue samples for, God, I'm old, decades now. So I know exactly how to do it and it's a huge pain. It's a huge pain. You need to get dry ice, you need to have it appropriately packaged, I would not have the average person shipping milk. So ideally, you really want to ha get milk from someone locally where you can pick it up or you guys can meet somewhere um, and so that you can just do this in a cooler without having to um, deal with shipping. So next, that's storage and collection. So yeah, uh, obviously a trusted friend or someone you know, someone, maybe a mutual acquaintance is the best um, source because then they'll give you honest answers and they're local. Next, there's a lot of communities. Well, I don't know if there's a lot. There's communities for online informal milk sharing. That's probably, well, that is definitely preferred over paid purchases like on Craigslist. You can buy a lot of breast milk on Craigslist. The reason communities are preferred is just like I said before, you're usually not exchanging money. And so mothers who are donating don't have any motivation to lie about the storage um, or anything. So you can trust more so than otherwise that they're giving you an honest answer. A lot of people buy milk off Craigslist and you just need to use your best judgment if you're going to do that. I can't recommend that you do that because of all the reasons I just said. They've also actually done studies where researchers bought milk on Craigslist and tested it for bovine products, so cow, and found that a lot of this milk had been topped off with cow's milk because these moms are making money off of it. So, um, so that's a concern in addition to contamination that you're not actually getting breast milk. There's no way to know in your own home. So it's hard. It's hard and I don't really have anything great to say to make you feel great about buying milk. So, but you need to, all those things that I said, you need to also engage with if you're buying milk, make sure you ask about. If, if it were me and I was buying milk, I wouldn't just trust her word she was HIV negative. I would ask to see the printout of her medical report, that kind of a thing. You know, you need to do a little more due diligence. So that's the storage and collection. The next thing I want to cover is pasteurization. You can actually pasteurize milk from another mom in your own home. So if you're getting, if you're lucky enough to have access to donor breast milk from a breast milk bank, they pasteurize it for you so you know it's safe. You can pasteurize at home so that if you have, um, if you have certain concerns, you can pasteurize in your own house. And this, I'm going to tell you how to do it. So, and if you want uh, a written answer or like written details from what I'm telling you, Google the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine Informal Milk Sharing and it will take you to their statement and they also provide this in-home pasteurization protocol there. So what you do is you get the breast milk that you just got from another mom, you put it into a glass jar, like a mason jar, it's gotta be glass, um, don't put the top on. 50, between 50 and 150 milliliters of milk into a glass jar. Then you put the jar into a, a pot or a pan of water and you fill it with water. So if here's your jar, you've got two fingers worth of water above where the milk is. So that's kind of like if you're melting chocolate to bake, right? So you, bring, you put the water up two fingers worth higher than where the milk is in your jar and you turn your stove onto the highest. If you've got a gas stove or an electric stove, just turn the flame or the heat onto the highest possible setting. Then sit and watch it because you wanna wait until the water is at a rolling boil, so big boil, um, and as soon as it hits there, you take the milk out. Now, you can't walk away because if you come back and it's been at a rolling boil, you can't use it and that's because um, if it's at a rolling boil for a long time, it can actually degrade some of the nutrients. And so you don't want to give your baby 
milk that doesn't have enough nutrients in it. And if you don't wait long enough, then it might not get hot enough to kill any potential bacteria or virus. So you gotta watch it. As soon as it gets to the rolling boil, take your mason jar of milk out and put it on the counter. Now, if you wanna feed it shortly, you can then put it into a container with cool water in it so it cools faster, but you can also just put it on the counter. Take a clean plate from your pantry and put it on top of the milk just so it's protecting the milk, so no dust particles or bacteria in the air can fall into your mason jar. So you cover it, let it cool, and then once it's cool, you can feed it. You can leave it out at room temperature if you're going to feed it to the baby within six hours, because of course it's got to cool. Be sure it's cool enough before you feed it to the baby. Or if you're going to feed it later, you can immediately put it in the refrigerator or you can refreeze it. A note on refreezing. It is safe from a contamination standpoint to refreeze it, but if you refreeze it, now it's been frozen once thawed, once refrozen, and then you're going to rethought. So that increases the amount of the funk factor you're going to have in the milk. So if you've got one of those kind of snobby babies who doesn't like the taste of frozen milk, just be prepared that it will get worse <laughs> if you refreeze it again. So that's pasteurization. So I think that it you know opens up a lot of opportunities for people who may be like closet informal milk sharing to be able to talk about it more openly where you can pasteurize in home and if we're not talking about it then the the this kind of information is not going to be shared. So pasteurizing at home is a really really great option if you have decided that you are going to informal milk share or feed your baby another mom's milk. Um I'm going to end with two general well a couple more points. If you're doing milk sharing, I have the general recommendation, just like formula, that I want you to mix as much as possible. Meaning if you are also providing any of your own breast milk, pumping your own breast milk, I want you to mix it as much as possible. Um, I guess also you're either providing your own breast milk or formula. Either way, I'd want you to mix it as much as possible. And that is because if, God forbid, you got milk from someone else that was infected or contaminated in some way, if you mix it with another liquid, you'll be diluting it a little bit. So like I said, God forbid there is an infection in there. If you, It's hopefully possible that you would dilute it out and so that it's not what we refer to as an infectious dose. It wouldn't be enough of that bacteria or whatever it was to make your baby sick. So it's just a, another little um, best practice from a safety standpoint. So mix as much as can as you can as opposed to providing like one bottle of your girlfriend's milk and one bottle of formula. Mix them together. And then the other thing that I do want to bring up that nobody really talks about, especially in groups where informal sharing um, is applauded, it is important to consider the age of your baby and the age of the milk that you are receiving. And this is because um, you know, the breastfeeding mother and infant is this magical system that has been, you know, gone through so many years of evolution and the milk that a mother makes for her baby is perfect for her baby at her baby's age. So the milk a mom makes for a one week old is very different from a milk that a mom makes when her baby is 12 months old. Now, it's still wonderful if you've got a girlfriend whose baby's 12 months old and you want to feed it to your one week old. You know, that's your choice. And I've asked you, I've, you know, if you're very, if it's your choice and you're very comfortable with it, then I'm comfortable with it. But I do not want you to feed that exclusively to your baby. This is an unusual case, but for example, zinc concentrations in breast milk go down over time. They really go down over time. So it's the perfect nutrient example because if you're feeding, if all your baby is eating, your baby's two weeks old, and all your baby's eating is milk that was pumped for even a six month old, eight month old, older baby, that milk will not have enough zinc to meet your baby's needs. Your baby will develop a zinc deficiency. Now it's very unusual that you would be exclusively feeding um, another mom's milk. You know, usually there's some formula or your own milk mixed in and you know, usually that's enough to make sure your baby is meeting their needs. But it is something that needs to be considered and something that I have never seen anybody talk about um, on some of these informal milk sharing sites or even at the doctor's office. So that's also just something to keep in your mind and something you would definitely want to ask anyone who's providing you milk is how old was your baby when you pumped this milk? So you kind of have an idea of how closely it's matching up to your own baby's age. Okay, Woo. that was quick. So now I'm gonna end on two general 
recommendations. So hopefully that was a lot of information. You can go back and watch this as many times as you need to if you're considering getting into the informal milk sharing game. Again, I'm making this video because I, I, I wanna ensure that as many babies are as safe as possible. And so I think that um, while I, as a medical professional, I cannot recommend informal milk sharing and several um, agencies have just said no and we won't discuss it but that doesn't change the fact that it's happening. And so if it is going to happen, I want it to happen in the safest possible conditions. So you need to consider your donor screening, you need to consider storage and collection, and then you need to consider maybe pasteurizing it in your own home as an option. My last two summary points are, um, one, if you're feeling worried or uncomfortable, don't use it. You know, if someone gives you, if someone just gives you milk, I hear this all the time, like, oh, my girlfriend gave me milk, but I don't know, I'm a little nervous, she partied too hard, whatever. Don't use it. You don't have to tell her. Just don't feed it. It's your babies. My approach with babies is it's so much better to be safe than sorry. So if you're feeling uncomfortable about it, don't use it. If you thought and there's a kind of a smell to it, you're not sure, don't use it. It's fine. That's what formula is for. <laughs> so don't take the risk if you think there's any risk there. And secondly, I suggest telling your doctor. I have spoken with so many women that do this. And they're like, but I haven't told my doctor because I know they wouldn't support it. Um, that's fine if they don't support it. Your doctor works for you. My doctor tells me all kinds of things that I don't do. Like my doctor would love for me to meditate and take more deep breaths and not work as much. And every time I go in, they're like, how's it going? I'm like, oh, I'm totally not doing that. And and that's it and we move on it's fine you can do things that your doctor doesn't agree with but it's more important that they know i especially hear this um occasionally from people who work in the NICU and they're like we know this mom is bringing in another mom's milk but you know it's kind of like a don't ask don't tell policy but in my opinion it would be so much better if you know you are in charge of your own baby. You are the expert on your own baby. You make choices for your own baby and they're your choices. And you are the best person to make those choices. And if your doctor disagrees, that's fine. And it's still better that they know because then they can share this information with you. If something else comes up I didn't talk about, they can share it with you. And then having the open discussion is, you know, we're all on the same page about keeping the baby safe. And their job is to support to do that within the context of your own decisions. So that's my kind of ending soapbox is, you know, remember that your doctor works for you and they are not in charge of your baby. So whatever choice you make, feel free to share that with them openly. Um, yes, and then that way they, they can incorporate that into their vast medical knowledge um, and observation of your baby and it's just so much better to have that person on your team than to have them in the dark about what's going on. So if you have any questions that I didn't answer that might be helpful, feel free to put them in the comments. I will get to them at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for watching. If you're having trouble with formula issues in your own home, I do work with clients individually and you can find information about how to work with me on my website, which is babyformulaexpert.com. And there's a tab up at the top that says work with Dr. Young. It's very easy to find. So click there and you can read all about how to work with me. If that would be helpful, I would love to help you and your family. You guys have an awesome, awesome weekend. I'm obviously not doing happy hour every week. I just can't get to it as much these days. So I will be back at some Friday in the future, um, and I'll see you then. Thanks so much. Bye.